battery system has reached epic proportions and Dave's here to break it all down with us now. Dave, how are you, sir? I'm well, thanks. Thanks thanks for having me on again, Sean. I love doing this show with you, but I think you might have exaggerated my skill set there a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I did. I don't think I did at all. And we're going to talk about your recent article, Gold and Silver are being bought on every manipulated hit. Guys, go to Investment Research Dynamics for the latest from Dave. He posts at least once a day, and they're always very entertaining, very pertinent articles. But Dave, first I want to start today talking about what is symptomatic of the systemic corruption of the United States government at levels which can no longer be denied. I've talked about this with John Titus as it relates to the Department of Justice essentially colluding with Goldman Sachs. And now, Dave, I have to play this clip for you in the audience from the State Department's spokesperson, about Hillary Clinton's emails. Listen to this, Dave, and tell me if this doesn't speak to the systemic corruption of the government. I mean, if if I understand it, is it the case that you have not found a single email related to Mr. Pagliano's service while Secretary Clinton was here? So that's accurate that we have located a PST from when his recent work with the department as a contractor, but not <laughs> that those were from after when Secretary Clinton left it, the department. Is it conceivable that he might have deleted every single email he sent during the period of Secretary Clinton's uh, service? I'm not going to speculate on that. I cannot say how or whether he stored records. And is it conceivable that nothing he committed to email during the time he was here uh, rose to the standard of a federal record? Um, I, I can't say on that. What I, I will say is the department's conducting a thorough search. At this stage, I just don't have any additional details to provide. Dave, could you hear that okay? Yes. So, Brian Pagliano, Hillary Clinton's IT guy, for four years, they can't find a single email from him relating to anything he ever did for Hillary. How convenient, huh? What's incredible about this is no one's brought up the the same thing happened with Lois Lerner. Remember her? I do. The IRS's Lois Lerner. Again, convenient. So many of the emails yeah. just vanished into the ether. The emails just vanish. Yeah, they it's just impossible. vanish. impossible. They vanish when you work for the government. But if you worked for a Fortune 100 corporation, I guarantee your emails would never vanish. If you did something bad or nefarious at a Fortune 100 company, they'll have the goods on you and they won't lose them. At the very worst case, the NSA has every email. So the you know the emails are get they 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 are gettable. They're I'm, you know they're they're retrievable, and I don't even think you need to go to the NSA. This is just another in a long line of cover-ups, and the reason why it happens is because the populace lets them get away with it. I mean, when you think about it, to me, every day I wake up and it blows my mind that Hillary Clinton is running for president. We know she's an, a criminal. That's right. You know, I think she may be, you know, insanely criminalistic. And it's almost like she flaunts it in front of us now. Yeah, that's exactly why I wanted to play that clip is because these people, Hillary Clinton, George Bush, <laughs> Jeb Bush, Ted Cruz, these people are part of the cabal. They're on the inside, which means they have cover for their crimes. And as it pertains to Hillary specifically, she is an uber criminal. And we don't need to go over the litany of her crimes. Everybody listening knows about Benghazi, knows about the secret email, knows about the, the private server set up at Chappaqua, knows about uh, Vince Foster, knows about the Rose Law Firm, knows about the crimes going back to Mena, Arkansas drug running under Bill Clinton with the CIA drug running. Uh, but she is an uber criminal in the same vein that George Soros and Henry Kissinger and George Bush Sr. are. An uber insider criminal, part of the pyramidal structure of power that comprises the deep state or the secret government. Honestly, I think she may be the most ruthless human being I've ever come across or read about. I mean, we're talking about on the on the scale of Idi Amin, Mussolini, Genghis Khan. Seriously. I agree. I, I honestly, I think, she, I don't even know if you could call her a human being. No, and I agree. And the reason I agree is because she never shows any remorse or any sincerity. There's absolutely no genuineness in the woman, which I, which I think is why so many people that would otherwise label themselves Democrats have sworn to vote against her because she is so obviously an insider. What, $675,000 for three Goldman Sachs speeches and she pretends to be against the banks? It's systemic corruption. 
it's it, again it's it, it's one of these things where you look at it and you say so it's come to this huh and at the end of the day though it's the population that lets them get away with it I think at some point you're gonna get a boil over in the population and that's when it's gonna get really interesting out there I know some people who are very efficient observers of what's going on and some people think we may start seeing a lot of that civil unrest by the end of the summer. You know what, I think that you're right, but I also think that regardless of what the population of the United States does or doesn't do, the rest of the world is waking up and not letting uh, this power structure get away with all measure of crime. And one of the examples of that that's quantifiable is France now speaking out against the TTP and the TTIP, the trade agreements. France saying these are just, uh, these are just structured agreements and treaties that benefit U.S. corporations and, and a whole other secret government. You've got uh, France and I believe Germany now speaking out against the sanctions against Russia. You know, you've got uh, other nation states, partners and allies of the United States now openly moving against the State Department's wishes in so many ways. And I think it's a beacon of hope. I, you know, I, when I saw that thing about France, my first instinct was hope. Like, hey, maybe this is going to stop the TTIP. But then I was thinking to myself, well, if I'm in France's position, I'm going to use it as a as a bargaining chip. So I, I don't, I haven't. Dis I guess we'll find out. You know, either either the French have finally decided to stand on principles on this and not support it, or they're using it to to hold up the U.S. to get some benefit out of it before they capitulate and give in and 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 support it. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 I think. And I'm hoping it's not the latter. I really am. Well, irregardless, uh, again, the men behind the curtain have been revealed, and the Emperor Obama, Hillary Clinton, the State Department, the DOJ, the Emperor has no clothes. I mean, it's clear, believe me, there are people smarter than you and I running in nation states on this planet that can see what's going on. Uh, our listeners and our readers, your readers know what's going on. The average American sheeple maybe doesn't, but I do think people are getting fed up, which is why you see this rise of support for Bernie Sanders, who at least represents the antithesis of Clinton to some degree. Same with the rise of Trump. I think people are fed up. Uh, but the other thing that people are fed up about is this evil monetary system that is literally enslaving people. In my latest interview with David Morgan, I made the point that money creation, Fed money creation equals slavery. As you know, Fed money creation is slavery. And in that video, I showed a $10 silver certificate from the late 1800s, which in today's value of silver is worth $175. Forget the, the value of the certificate, which is probably worth far more as a collector's item, but a $10 <laughs> silver certificate in the late 1800s represents $175 in silver today, Dave. But today, a $10 Federal Reserve note equals 10 bucks, which means the purchasing power of the dollar has fallen 95%, while the mechanism for earning that dollar has stayed the same, and that mechanism is our labor. We trade our labor for their BS paper, their fiat criminal paper, and people are fed up, which is why you wrote this latest article, gold and silver are being bought on every manipulated hit. Yes, that's correct. And I think, I think what is going on there is that for, for gold and silver to offset the paper manipulation, it's not going to take a very large percent. It's going to take just a small sliver of the population over and above that's buying gold and silver now to come in and buy gold and silver. And I think we're starting to see that. And I think it's because more and more people, it's finally, they're finally figuring out just how corrupt the system is, just how fraudulent the U.S. dollar is, just, just how, what a giant Ponzi scheme the entire U.S. system is. And if you want to sit there and think about, well, how do I protect myself from that? I mean, away from... <laughs> arming your house, you know, like fort, like a fort, you know, to, to, to protect your financial well-being, you need to get your money out of the system and into gold and silver. And I think a lot more people are starting to figure that out. And again, when I say a lot more, let's say for the first 10 or 12 years of the bull market in gold and silver, I would, I would estimate less than 1% of the population was actually buying gold and silver, physical gold and silver. And if you increase that amount to say two to three percent, you're going to create a, a move in gold and silver that will blow everyone away, including guys like us who have been long time gold investors. 
Well, yeah, absolutely. And I want to quantify what you're saying by telling you, and I know you know this, is that the percentage has already doubled, tripled, and uh, quintupled in some cases, and even more. And let me give you one concrete example of that. I'm going to show you guys a Canadian maple leaf sales chart from SRS Rocco. Dave, I've been acquiring Canadian silver maples for a very long time, and I have many in my collection from uh, the late 90s and early 2000s when the total production run for a year's supply of Canadian silver maples was less than a million. In some cases, 500,000, 300,000 total maples were made. Look at this chart, Dave. In 2014, 29 million Canadian maples were sold. In last year, in 2015, 34.3 million Canadian silver maples were sold. That's on the backdrop of previous years running down around 5 to 10 million. So right there, you're talking about a tripling in the interest of people buying physical silver maples. It's a big deal. It can't be overstated. Oh, I agree with that. And, you know, the mint, the U.S. Mint is, you know, they only produce a million silver eagles a week. And you have to wonder how much greater would their sales be if they were producing more than a million, if they were producing enough to meet, you know, the amount that everyone would be buying every week. And I can guarantee you that on every price hit in silver and gold, all the all the bullion dealers out there, their phones are ringing off the hook with people calling in to buy silver. Yeah, I yeah. think you're right. And uh, in real terms, as you noted in your article here, most international fiat currencies could come to be near valueless when measured against gold and silver. That's not hyperbole, Dave. You and I have been talking a long time about the 1988 cover of The Economist magazine in which we see a phoenix rising from a burning pile of fiat. That's the Rothschild magazine. And what what the cover say? Get ready for a global currency. What's around the phoenix's neck? A gold medallion with the year 2018 stamped into it. We're at 2016 and a half, Dave. I think the day of valueless currencies is on its way. It certainly is on its way for the people of Venezuela. Oh my God, look what's going on there. I agree with that. And here's the thing, though. I think the way this is unfolding is not going the way that the Rothschild clan had envisioned it. Because I, we're, we're seeing, really what we're seeing, in my opinion, is China and Russia, and I guess you could probably just call it the whole, the entire BRIC consortium, is sort of usurping the, the Western one world, one government movement, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I think so. A lot of, one thing that, that doesn't get a lot of airplay, if any at all, is the fact that, you know, everyone knows China's buying gold hand over fist. And there's no telling how much gold they really own. But what's interesting is that for the last few years, they've had programs in place that encourage their population to buy gold and silver. That's right. I and that doesn't happen over here. If anything, all we get every day when you turn on the financial media or open up Barron's or open up your local newspaper are anti-gold articles, anti-gold propaganda, discouraging the population from, from buying precious metals. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I just touched on that exact fact with David Morgan in our recent uh, discussion, and uh, I think it warrants mentioning you brought up China. Look what's going on in China with the Shanghai Futures Exchange uh, silver holdings. My God, David, they're challenging J.P. Morgan's position, right? 67,200,000 ounces of physical silver supposedly held by J.P. Morgan's uh, comics position, and uh, the SGE now has 60 million. Over the past several weeks, according to SRS Rocco, the Shanghai Futures Exchange added another 179 metric tons, or 5.8 million ounces, of physical silver. Now, if we update the J.P. Morgan and SGE silver stock chart, this is what we see. I'll put the chart up here for you guys to take a look. And we can see that J.P. Morgan's total silver inventories have declined from 69.4 million ounces to 67.2 million, while the SGE silver stocks have increased from 54.7 million to 60.6 million ounces. If the SGE exchange continues to add silver at this rate, says Steve St. Angelo, it will surpass JP Morgan in just a few weeks. It's a big deal and we need to hit on it because again, we talk about it a lot, Dave, physical precious metals are moving from the West to the East and it's quantifiable and uh, the Fed can no longer deny it. That's, that's an interesting point to make there, but what that only the scope of what that only covers is JP Morgan's reported inventories on the COMEX, which I don't necessarily trust. Right. I mean, if JP Morgan's honestly reporting what they're holding, and I think it's a lot less than what they're reporting, it would be the only area of their business that they report honestly, because they don't report anything else honestly. 
and I can take you through their financials and through the footnotes of their financials and show you where their where their 10k is basically a fraud but I would like to know what's really behind the curtain at SLV because again I would say there's significantly less actual unencumbered physical silver sitting in the SLV vault than is than they than they report every day. And guess who the custodian is of the of the SLV metal? Yeah, JP, JP Morgan. Morgan. Right. <laughs> so the other thing that we should flush out here is what's going on in China, and China actually holds its silver on the Shanghai futures exchange is what I think they call it, but the Shanghai Gold Exchange is just for gold. So, um, but that's that's just a, you know an unimportant technicality. The point is they're stockpiling a boatload of silver, and if you're an investor, look at it from their point of view. Silver is probably I said at the beginning of the year that silver was going to be the best performing asset class at least through the end of the decade. Yeah, and you've been right so far. You've been right and, this year. Well, you know, we're only five months in, and, and yeah, so far it's been outperforming. And I haven't checked that against every single commodity, but for the major ones that everyone follows regularly, silver has been the best performing asset class, including oil, which has had a manipulated hit. Silver is absolutely the cheapest investment on the face of the earth right now in relationship to gold, and especially in relationship to any, any of these any stocks or bonds out there. So if you're sitting on a pile of, of fiat dollars and you're looking at where to invest it, the most logical place to invest it is silver. And that's what China's doing. Well, it's a powerful chart and it's a powerful quantifiable fact. And your point's a good one about J.P. Morgan. If they don't report honestly about the rest of their business, why would we believe what they say about their silver position? But what we do know, and I think it's probably quantifiable, I've not actually done the audit, but I bet what's going on at the SGE or the Shanghai Futures Exchange is quantifiable. They're not playing paper games. They are actually acquiring physical silver, uh, which is anathema. It's the absolute antithesis. It's the opposite of what we see at the LBMA, which is a criminal paper fraud, and what we see at the comics, a criminal paper fraud. The criminal paper fraud and the systemic corruption of the U.S. government, as I started talking about at the beginning of the interview with the State Department covering up for Hillary, David, is it's all being laid bare for the world to see. The paper fraud, the systemic corruption, it's all in the open. Yes, that's correct. And I've I've always I always look at the COMEX as being the poster child for the Ponzi scheme and fraud that is really our complete system now. And it goes from every branch of government, even even the judicial branch at this point. There there there's probably the least corrupted branch of government, but it's still largely corrupted. I mean all you gotta do is look at the Supreme Court to know that. Mm -hmm. And look at the Southern District of Manhattan to know that. And look at the CFTC. I mean, they, they've they looked supposedly four times now. And everyone else can see the manipulation on the COMEX, but for some reason they can't. And, and to, you know, so you got the COMEX on one hand and then Hillary Clinton's presidency on the other. And if that doesn't describe just how corrupt our entire system has become, I don't know what else does. Yeah. yeah, I've described it as a banana republic, and some people have corrected me in saying it's not that bad yet. But I think if you look at the definition of a banana republic, which I'll put up on the screen right now, we're darn close. And I just want to end with this, Dave, uh, again, in that David Morgan interview. I put up in that interview as part of the title, a beautiful $10 U.S. Treasury silver certificate. And on it, it says 10 silver dollars. I want you to just take a look at that photograph, Dave, and imagine currency as beautiful as that and juxtapose that against a $10 Federal Reserve note today and tell us what comes to mind. N-O-T-E is all you need to know, Federal Reserve note. It means it's it's a counterparty obligation of the Federal Reserve and ultimately of the U.S. government as opposed to the silver certificate which lets you, uh, what you were able to do back then was take it to your local bank and exchange it for for ten dollars worth of silver and real money and when you hold that silver in your hand you know there's no counterparty obligation that that is responsible for proving out the value of that silver in your hand and what really drives that point home I love it when I put a roll of silver eagles in someone's hand for the first time and you can just see the look on their face it's like all of a sudden they realize what real money is 100% agree 
they I mean they literally do people innately recognize it as wealth and I've often said when you put your silver stack in a little box or a little treasure chest it literally is pirate's booty because uh, I mean it literally is found treasure especially to the sheeple people who have never seen that type of thing when they hold a silver coin or a gold coin in their hand they innately immediately recognize it as actual real wealth and uh, it's shocking that so many people in this country, 98, 99 percent of them, don't own a single silver or gold coin, Dave, and they're not prepared for what's coming. You know what? And that's fine. All I want is is that percentage to go from you know one or two percent to three or four percent because that's going to drive the price of gold and silver to the moon. Yeah, I think you're right, but I think the Chinese are already making that move, and I think most of the American folks. At least the ones that don't listen to broadcasts like this, they're going to be the ones left behind. It's going to be the Chinese and people in Asia that are going to be protecting themselves with physical precious metals long before the average American sheeple people wake up. And uh, it's a sad state of affairs. But again, guys, take a look at that $10 silver certificate from the 1800s and contrast that against this crappy $10 note. That silver certificate is worth $175 today in silver. That $10 Federal Reserve note, it's worth $10 bucks if you're lucky. What is that, a 95, 96% decrease in purchasing power? Well, the mechanism for earning that dollar has not changed. Your physical labor must be exchanged for their paper fiat debt-based notes. And that is total tyranny. Those are the chains we need to throw off, this corrupt system of Federal Reserve money creation. It's the root of all evil. And our friend Dave Kranzler is one of those guys out there trying to expose it every single day. Guys, you can find Dave's work at Investment Research Dynamics. And Dave, tell us about your newsletter, will you? Well, I've got two of them. One is the Short Sellers Journal, which has been around since early January. And that's a, that's a weekly newsletter subscription, uh, monthly subscription basis. So you, if you don't like it, you can cancel after a month. And I come up with a couple short sell ideas every week. And I also provide some some what I think is my sort of unique or original insight on what's going on in the stock market. Um, one of the ideas that I had presented maybe about eight weeks ago was Lending Tree, and I recommended shorting it. And again, I don't remember the exact price. I think it was around $92 a share, and it ran up to the high 90s really briefly, and today it's at 67 Hmm. And I had put recommendations in there that are up about four or five hundred percent at this point. So that's an example of. Now I've had some other ideas in there that have gone against me, but that, that's a function of what they've been doing with the stock market. But Lending Tree, the fact that it's down thirty-three percent while the S and P is actually higher than it was when I recommended Lending Tree, is an example of the value added that I think I provide with the Short Sellers Journal, and then the. The sister publication is the Mining Stock Journal, and that's bi-monthly. And I wanted to do it bi-monthly because each, each, every two weeks, I present a what I hope is a largely undiscovered or not as well-known junior mining stock idea. And my next issue is actually coming out this evening, and I've got an idea in there that maybe a lot of people have heard about but haven't really looked at it. And this is a truly undervalued stock and they actually have a, a, a gold royalty stream that's pay, current pay I mean it's generating right now with gold at this level about seven million dollars a year in cash flow um, and they've got some some potential blockbuster deals right around the corner that could you know make this stock double or triple in value very quickly so and that's the mining stock journal and again with that one I kind of provide what I think is sort of my unique insight on what's going on in the precious metals market and I kind of draw on on having been around and studied and invested and traded the sector for about 15 years so and if someone subscribes to both of them they're they're twenty dollars a month each or thirty dollars if you subscribe to both of them combined well very good and guys as you know Dave Kranzler's pumping out excellent articles on a daily basis 